so now we can talk about uh, viruses. Um, now, this is really important. Um, the whole time I've been teaching biology, they consider viruses non-living. Okay, this is really important. Um, however, so if you're if you're taking a test in biology or anything like that, and you see they ask you if viruses are, you should say no. However, there is a huge debate in the scientific community as to whether viruses are living or not. So, um, in the textbooks and things like that, they make it they make it like it's a decided issue, but it's really not. Um, and the reason is um, the textbooks and things say that viruses are non-living because they don't have a metabolism. They don't have homeostasis, they don't grow, they have to have a host to reproduce, and they don't have any organelles or cytoplasm. Okay. So there's a really efficient little balls of DNA, basically. Um, and so um, they consider them to be, uh, you know, they, when you talk about those, those like properties of life that you find like the beginning of biology, maybe biology A, they don't have hardly any of them. Right, but they do have DNA and they do reproduce. So therefore, people think, well, you know, rocks don't have DNA and rocks don't reproduce. So, you know, a virus is not exactly rock, right? It's something in between a rock and like a, you know, a bacteria or a cat or something. Okay. So basically, uh, viruses are, are um, they have a coat or like an outer covering, and then they have something called an envelope, which is a, a membrane surrounding the capsule of some viruses, and then they have some different shapes. Okay, so um, this right here is the tobacco mosaic virus. This is a T4 bacterial phage, and this is actually the HIV virus, um, and it has a lipid envelope. Um, so those are some common examples they might refer to. You might see those. Um, so how does a virus uh, reproduce? Um, a provirus will insert his DNA into the host chromosome, and the host just replicates that DNA. Okay. So the host thinks that the virus DNA is the host DNA, and it just kind of takes it along and replicates it just like it's replicating its own DNA. Um, a retrovirus will carry RNA instead of DNA. So instead of a little ball of DNA, it's a little ball of RNA. And then um, within the cell, the cell will use um, reverse transcriptase to make that DNA, that RNA as a template to make DNA, and then it will start reproducing the DNA. So it's just like an extra step. Um, now we have these two cycles, the lytic cycle and the um, lysogenic cycle for um, bacteria, and basically it's how they reproduce. Um, so, for example, this would be a bacteriophage is something that infects a bacteria, but that's what they're showing in this picture as a little bacteriophage. Uh, basically, it's going to um, rupture the whole, it's going to, it's going to basically like send its DNA into the cell, right? That's what it's doing here. This is the DNA. And then it kind of flows away. Then the cell starts replicating that DNA and just making lots of little baby bacteriophages and keeps making them, keeps making them. And then when the cell is basically full of little bacteria, the cell will lyse. That's where they get the name lytic cycle. It'll, and basically it explodes and releases all these little virus cells. And then these little viruses, each one goes and infects a different cell. Okay. So that's kind of how, um, and that's, that's how they say that like you can be infected with a virus for a while, you know, like a day or two, a couple days. It's actually feel symptoms because there's this lag time, right, where these viruses are kind of being built in the cell and then exploding. And then, you know, these go, like this guy goes and infects the new cell, makes a whole bunch more, and then they go and infect, 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 and it's kind of like this explosive um, exponential release of these um, bacterial or viral cells. So it takes a lot of basically. Then we have something called a lysogenic cycle. And this is 
um, kind of what the AIDS virus does a little bit. Um, and basically, the, um, the virus injects his DNA, and his DNA actually binds with the host cell DNA. You see this, this part right here? That's the virus DNA. And then the host cells just keep reproducing and keep reproducing. And then something happens, the, you know, the, the timing is right or whatever it is, and all of a sudden that viral DNA becomes active and it starts making lots of little baby viruses, okay? And after all, these cells have, you know, already we have lots and lots of host cells that have all these little baby viruses, all the virus DNA in there. So something happens and it's like a switch turns and they all start becoming little virus factories. And then they explode and there's like all these different viruses coming out or all, well, they're the same virus, but all these little replicates of that same virus kind of coming out. So that lysogenic cycle is kind of um, where it can hide um, for a little bit. And that lytic cycle is that part where it just makes it and then it escapes. Now, um, let's talk about viral diseases. Um, so a vector is some sort of host that can transfer the pathogen to another organism. So for example, a mosquito can hold viruses. Um, then a mosquito is often considered one of the deadliest or the deadliest um, organism on the planet because it can carry so many diseases with it. And so um, all of these, are viral diseases. Uh, chicken pox mingles hepatitis for chicken pox. Now, I remember when I was a kid, they didn't have a vaccine. But then when my brother and sister were little, they came out with a vaccine. And my mom said she was there the day the vaccine came out. Like she called the doctor and was like, when this is coming out, I'm going to be there first thing. She had my brother and sister vaccinated that very first day because she'd had that, uh, chicken pox. She dealt with having me, me having chicken pox, and she dealt with my sister having chicken pox, and she was like, no more. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Any more children with this disease. So my brother and my sister, my two youngest siblings, they were vaccinated for the chicken pox at a very, very young age um, because of that. She had dealt with it with us. Um, they have hepatitis now, um, and then, of course, AIDS is a virus. So how do we treat a virus? Um, there's a couple things you can do. You can do preventative treatment, which is like a vaccine, right? Um, so like polio or chicken pox, smallpox, diphtheria, whooping cough, all of those things, those are called, um, it's like a preventative treatment, right? Because you're getting it before you get sick. Um, these illnesses are so bad and they can be so, especially in young children, they can um, kill them so easily that it's considered better to just vaccinate them and then they won't get those illnesses. And then also there's also um, there's something called herd immunity, which um, a lot of folks in the anti-vaccination community don't understand. And what herd immunity is, is um, when lots and lots and lots of folks are vaccinated, it's very unlikely, even if the, vir if the viral par particles are moving around, it can't basically stick to anybody because no, everyone's vaccinated, right? So it's less, it doesn't spread very easily. So then let's say you have someone who has childhood cancer or you have someone that has some sort of other immune, autoimmune disease where they can't get a vaccination. By having almost everyone vaccinated, except for those few little people that medically can't have vaccines because they're already so sick, you're Basically, you're providing a place where that vaccine or that um, virus, it doesn't have anybody to attach to. And it's, it's very unlikely that it's going to get to that child that has that autoimmune disease and can't have a vaccine. And so you're basically, um, you're protecting other children. Okay, so that's why, for example, vaccinated parents don't want their kids vaccinated kids near unvaccinated kids, not because they think they're going to, their vaccinated kids are going to get the sickness, but let's say, for example, my toddler, he's almost three, he's going to preschool in the fall. Let's say he went to a preschool with some children that were not vaccinated, and they got whooping cough, and he was um, 
exposed to them before their symptoms came because we just talked about how it takes a little bit for the symptoms to show up right for the virus doesn't work immediately well he hangs out with those children you know they touch his shoes they touch his clothes his backpack him his skin everything then he comes home and my six-month-old has not had all his vaccinations because he's a baby and it takes a while to get all your vaccines so my then he brings that illness basically those illness those viral particles home and then my six-month-old touches his hands and touches his shirt and touch you know because my six-month-old thinks that my toddler is like god's gift to children he thinks he's like the coolest thing then my six-month-old gets that illness right even though my son is vaccinated you know the older one is vaccinated the the little one is not totally vaccinated yet and so the little one could get sick from a kid that is not um been vaccinated and so that's why people that um vaccinate their children don't want their kids around non-vaccinated kids it's not because they think that they're gonna get sick um, from the vaccinated children because they've had the vaccines they, they won't that's how vaccines work it's because they don't want usually like younger siblings or things like or you know they don't want to spread those particle those viral particles around um so so uh, anyway a vaccine is a preventative measure then we have something called vector control that's also preventative so for example um let's say you you know they spray a bunch of like when i lived in florida they had these airplanes that would spray like um home crop dusters and they would spray like mosquito um insecticide all over the place to kill the mosquitoes and so that would be considered vector control because you're preventing disease by killing the vector then there's something called drug therapy which is basically like treating the symptoms um, and this is because there is no antibiotic for viruses they're not like bacteria okay you can't take an antibiotic for a virus you can't take an antibiotic for the flu okay so basically treat your symptoms so like AIDS patients for example they get a variety of drug cocktails to try and basically prevent them from getting secondary bacterial infections and things